blessed Christmas to everybody. We're uh, getting close, aren't we? 13th of December. So uh, let's look to the Lord for his help this morning. Father, as always, we depend on you to come here and speak to us. And we're glad to assemble under the circumstances, uh, particularly, Lord, that we're allowed and permitted here. And we pray that uh, all will go well and that you'll keep us all quite safe uh, from others and from each other here. So help us, Lord, to uh, abide by the uh, codes and do our best, Lord, to get through. And uh, we pray that this soon will pass. Uh, so we thank you for the great hope that you give to us in Jesus Christ. And this is a season of joy and hope, and uh, we intend to enjoy it despite all the uh, prohibitions that have happened here. So help us, Lord, in uh, keeping the word heart in our hearts. Help us, Lord, to take uh, fast hold of that which we hear today and to be edified and strengthened in the inner men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, I've got something a little unusual for you here this morning uh, for one of our uh, songs. This man, uh, Hugh Martin, was the songwriter of a famous hymn. It's kind of a secular hymn that you hear everywhere you go, have yourself a Merry Christmas. It's, it, it's always had kind of a maudlin um, uh, approach to it. Even the music itself seems to be rather depressing. I consider it depressing. It's not, well, anything that doesn't mention Jesus is going to be depressing, isn't it? Okay. Well, sometimes you need to know the backstory on some of this, and I, I kind of uh, find it fascinating to look and see what the history of the song was all about. And Hugh Martin uh, wrote this for a movie starring Judy Garland in 1944, and that movie was entitled uh, Meet Me in St. Louis. Kind of a dangerous place to meet people today, but I don't, <laughs> at any rate, it was a happy. Well, uh, Hugh Martin, the songwriter, uh, submitted the song, and uh, the producer and Judy Garland said it was too lugubrious to sing. It was too depressing, and uh, they, he, they demanded that he change the words. So I looked up to see what the original wording was. And it was, have yourself a merry little Christmas. It may be your last. Next year may be all, we may all be living in the past. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Pop that champagne cork. Let next year we will, next year we will all be living in New York. No good times like the olden days. Happy golden days of yore, faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us no more. But at least we will all be together if the fates allow. From now on, we'll have to muddle through somehow. So have yourself a merry little Christmas. So that's how it actually, that's the genesis of the song. That's how it, he wrote it because he himself um, was a depressed individual. And so um, for many years he battled uh, addiction and the bottle and ended up um, hospitalized in 2005 while battling this addiction and a nervous breakdown. But Martin then cried out to the Lord to heal him. His prayer was answered and he committed himself to Christian service and rewrote the lyrics for his famous song. I thought you'd like to hear the song you never hear sung, the way it, he changed it to be sung. What are you going to sing tonight? We're going to be singing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, but with a bit of a change of lyrics. Uh, the guy that wrote this song uh, found faith and changed it to Have Yourself a Blessed Little Christmas. That's what we're going to do for you. Can't wait to hear it. Collabro, ladies and gentlemen. Serenade the earth to 
an intriguing change. <laughs> well, what does Psalm 40 tell us? Well, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, put my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, many shall see it in fear and trust in the Lord. It was a happy ending to all that, that Hugh Martin finally found the Lord. And I've never heard that song uh, sung with that kind of vitality and joy. Uh, like I said, anytime I've heard it, it's always put you in a depressing mood. But, and you can see what happened after uh, the change that comes to a person's life when you know Jesus and you have the hope of resurrection and you can have power over addiction and depression and everything that he faced. He had to change the lyrics, didn't he? So, um, that, as Paul Harvey would say, and that's the rest of the story. It's where we'll take up this, this morning as well as tonight. Seventh verse, where the angels uh, accost the women that came to anoint the dead body. And um, their response or reaction is, uh, he's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. So uh, they remind the ladies and the ladies, of course, uh, are shocked when they, uh, they hear those words. And uh, they actually requote Jesus, the Son of Man uh, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So uh, that had been told about uh, at least three times on separate occasions that we see throughout the four Gospels, perhaps even more than that. It was something that he had apprised his disciples of, but they didn't seem to understand. They didn't, they didn't grasp its meaning. To some degree, they thought Jesus was speaking as often he did esoterically. So it was hard for them to understand what he meant when he said this. They expected him to take uh, control of the throne and, uh, and become the king of the Jews and to rout the Romans and uh, become king of the world. But 
they didn't see the cross. The shadow of the cross was way ahead of all that had to come first before he comes back in glory. But assuredly, he will come back in glory and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And that will be a great day for all believers. And then it says this strange thing as they heard the uh, angels. Uh, let's not forget uh, that angels are fearful beings. They're not quite what we have in mind when we see television programs and so forth of little angels coming with wings. And so that's not quite the way the Bible describes it. When they came, they, they were fearful. And the lightning uh, uh, that seemed to shine with them, almost uh, a flash so great that you couldn't look upon. So there's fear that's mingled here as uh, they're hearing, and then they're receiving a rebuke from the angels. Why, what are you doing here? He's not here. You should have known this. He said this in advance. And why don't you believe him? Why didn't you believe him? Essentially, that's what they're doing. They're lecturing the women for coming and looking and hoping that they'd find uh, the dead body of Jesus when he told them he would rise again on the third day. And they remembered his words at that point. It, it was a moment of revelation. How did you come to Jesus? I'm not quite sure what everybody's story is here, but it was some circumstance at some point. You weren't born a Christian, I can tell you that, even though your parents probably baptized you and you went to Sunday school or catechism or some sort of formal training, but that, that didn't convert your soul. What converts your soul is a moment, an awakening where it all of a sudden it, it, it all seems to come together and you understand what this means for the first time maybe. Yeah. You really understand what it means. Yeah. And it has that impact as an eternal impact upon the soul. Yeah. You remember now what his words really mean and all of a sudden it comes flooding back into you. Yeah. You know when a person first gets saved and they get uh, start coming to church and they, they come at Christmas time and they hear all those familiar carols, Silent Night, No Come All You Faithful, Hark the Herald Angels, and all these things that we know by rote, by memory, uh, we learn them as children, all of a sudden they have a different meaning. And you begin to say, you piece it all together. You know, the light dawns, as it were. Amen. And that, so they remembered his words. All of a sudden they said, well yeah, well, yeah, he did say that as a matter of fact. And is that what this means? Now it, it began to uh, dawn upon them, so to speak. This scripture tells us, uh, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it in Isaiah 55. So God said, I'm going to send my word out, but it's going to have its effect. And it has its effect on everybody here this morning and will continue to have an effect upon you because the word does not return empty, void. God has a purpose in giving this word. You know, religions come and go. They're founded by people. Yeah. But God's word is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. But my word shall not pass away. Amen. And you're born again of that word by hearing that word. In 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Amen. So you can understand the, the vivifying power of the word and what, what it was meant to be. It, it, it accomplishes its purpose. And even in the unbeliever, it accomplishes its purpose, a sad purpose at that. It's condemnatory. Because at the end, Jesus said, There's one that will judge you at the end, the word which I have spoken unto you. So, uh, if you reject his word, then you will have to give an answer to God one day for your rejection. His word was made available. Uh, it's, uh, it's what this scripture is all about. It accomplished its purpose at every time. So, best that we remember his word, just like these ladies. In fact, there's a good way to do that, and that's to memorize it and to put it in your heart. This Psalm, Psalm 119 tells us, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by giving heed thereto to thy word, thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. So God has given us uh, an instruction here to put it in the heart. It's much easier, uh, well, our young people here are learning the word of God, even while I'm preaching, they're out learning the word of God, and Wednesday nights they're learn the word and memorize the scripture and I think it fascinates most of the adults here because you, you realize your kids are just soaking it in and uh, it might be a bit of a labor now because well let's face it some of you here are getting older 
And with that is the corruption of the body and the mind kind of goes to seed too, doesn't it? So best that we put it early in our hearts, early. Get that word in there and let, and let it uh, seep into the soul. And I guarantee you that long after you forget a lot of things, you'll still remember God's word. Amen. I mean, everybody today, no matter uh, where I am and what circumstance I'm in, if I recite the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my Everybody knows it, so uh, it's there permanently. We remembered his words. We hid his word in our hearts. Peter speaks about stirring up remembrance, which is what church service is supposed to be. It's a stirring up. Exhortation is the word. So it's a stirring you up to remember the things that we already know are true. I make no apology for repetition. It's a great teacher, first of all. But the truths that we're repeating are worth hearing over and over and over again. We'll never get tired of it. As the songwriter wrote, tell me the story of Jesus. We want to hear it, and we never get tired of hearing it. Wherefore, I will not be negligent, Peter said, to put you always in remembrance of these things, uh, though ye know them, and they're established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He repeats this. And again, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Now, there are four references right there. Peter repeats himself and uh, continues to tell people, look, I'm going to, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, as long as I'm in this body, Peter said, I'm going to stir up your remembrance and get you going. I have a little illustration that I normally use at this point, but my wife loves... Uh, Hershey syrup. Anybody here loves Hershey syrup? Uh, uh, huh? Well, she gets the giant double version and so forth. And uh, sometimes she uses milk. Oftentimes not. But if she puts it in the chocolate milk, she'll pour a bunch of it in, and then she puts the she puts the milk on top of it, uh, stirs it slightly, drinks it, and then waits for the the residue that's in the bottom. And it comes slowly trickling down, uh, and she she loves that uh, chocolate, right? I say, look, you got to stir it up, right? Yeah, you're supposed to stir it up. No, no, she wants she she likes the concentrated form. <laughs> but we want to stir up the truth that's in you. If you've been coming to the church uh, for a number of years, some of you 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 know these truths, and these truths are stirring up. And as soon as they stir, they stir up a certain passion, emotion, when you hear them. There are people I know that uh, when they hear the word, uh, they want to jump out of their skin. They get, get so excited about what they're hearing because they know the verity of those truths. And of course, all of this has to do with our joyous hope when we finally see the Master. It was Joshua who had to take the reins after Moses was taken by the Lord. And uh, we find in the very first chapter that Joshua says, this book of the law, he's talking about the Bible, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, remembering and meditating day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. Uh, then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. So it's the God's success formula is knowing his word and remembering it and of course living it, applying it. James warned about being a forgetful hearer, uh, listening to the word of God and uh, giving your amen to it and then walking out and not living it. That's called hypocrisy, isn't it? And uh, most people are disturbed about church because nothing but hypocrites attend church. That's how they look at it and so forth. Well, God forbid you hear the word, do what the word of God says. No matter what your habits have been all of your life and what your language has been like or what your uh, habits are, visiting the bars and the brothels and whatever other places, if you hear from God and his word that we ought not to talk that way or live this way, then do what you hear. Remember it and live it. It's a success formula. So shalt thou prosper and have good success. That's what he promised. And so the angels now seemingly appear and disappear at will. They live in a different dimension. 
and they departed quickly. Now we've got the ladies after they got their, their lecture. Apparently they go in the tomb at this point. He is not there just as the angel said. He's not here. All they see are the grave clothes lying in a place by itself, as John's gospel says. And so when they see this, it's just more convincing. What the angels had said is so. He's not here. He is risen. And as that patent fact becomes a reality, their faith now is strengthened by the word that they heard. Now, they haven't seen Jesus yet. They're only going to operate by faith here. They haven't seen him. But they believe the word. And that's all it takes to get to heaven, folks. You're not going to see him here in this world. But faith will bring you to him one day. And so they departed. And they departed quickly, by the way, from the sepulcher. Notice this, and I have it underlined, with fear and great joy. With fear and great joy. So, <laughs> that's like opposites, right? We're at the uh, emotional spectrum. So we have fear on one side of the spectrum and joy on the other side. And ne'er shall the twain meet, you would think, except here it does. How can you be both fearful and joyful all at the same time? Well, there's a certain mystery to that, perhaps, but um, it's not the only place in the Scripture that we find that. We find these two uh, opposite emotions appearing. For instance, at the birth of Jesus. That which we're celebrating here in this month of December. So the angel said when he visits Mary to give the news that you're about to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. That you will remain a virgin and yet you will produce a man child who will be the savior of the world. The greatest news the world has ever heard. And uh, notice when the angel appears, the angel said unto her, fear not. Behold, I bring thee good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you, shall, and so on. So, fear not. I'm bringing good tidings, good news, the gospel. That's what the word means. Great joy. And there is no greater joy, beloved. I don't know what the world has happiness, I would imagine. To those people, happiness is going out and having a party and, you know, throwing up their hands and getting drunk, maybe. To them, that's happiness, just like uh, Hugh Martin for all those years. He wasn't happy at all. Uh, he's living with the rest of the world and all the uh, accoutrements and all the pleasures of the world, but he didn't have Christ. So he was empty inside. And so he could write depressing songs because of that. But then he found great joy when he found Jesus Christ. He didn't need his alcohol anymore. He didn't need some stimulant to give him some kind of fake joy. He had an everlasting joy. And believers have that joy. I hope everybody here has joy. Not just happiness, because happiness is temporal. Joy, that's something you can have even in the midst of the worst trial and tribulation. And some of you know that by experience. Well, Mary found it out. So here's the angel appears. Fear not. Well, of course, you know, at first you see an angel that comes from heaven, glowing with the Shekinah of God. It's a fearful thing. And of course, if angels normally, when they would appear, it meant judgment time. Sodom and Gomorrah had two angels that came to appear to them. And that was the death sentence upon that evil city. So naturally, you would be startled and fearful. And yet, what was the angel bringing but the greatest news that the world had ever heard? A Savior is to be born. And you have been chosen by God to be the, re, uh, the, the place where God would actually lay forth his seed. This eternal uh, divine miracle called incarnation. So it was a great joy. Uh, which shall be not just to you, but to all people. For unto you is born this day. The city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So uh, we rehearse all of this at this time of the year. Of course, this isn't the only place that fear and joy are mingled together. We find it also on the mountain. Up on the mountain of Bethlehem, those faithful poor shepherds. God came to reach the poor, didn't yeah. he? He came to those that have not, not and he was going to bring to naught things which are with them. And so there they are doing what they have been doing faithfully now uh, from their youth, watching over the flock by night. 
they would provide the Passover lambs. And so they were raising up the flock and eventually they'd take some of those lambs down uh, two miles, four miles away. They would get to the temple and they would offer up uh, the sacrifices, the Passover lambs. They'd give, the, give them over and go back and re-raise some more and so forth so that there was perpetual sacrifice. And here, all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And what does the angel say? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. So they got the same message that Mary got. There's going to be a Savior that's born. And uh, we're giving the announcement, the birth announcement, to you shepherds. And I thought that was a thrilling thing to get the uh, to get the evangel, the good news. So many of the important religious people of the time, God completely bypassed. High priest wasn't told this. The scribes, the Pharisees that served every day in the temple, they didn't hear the message. God went to poor people, shepherds, with a probably a very meager understanding of the scripture. But, you know, God delights in using the base things of the world, things which are not to bring to not things which are. When we get a little further on chapter 24, you're going to find there's also some fear and joy mingled in with his resurrection. In the upper room are uh, locked in the 11 apostles. Judas has already hung himself. And they're there because they're afraid. They're afraid to come out of the room because they're afraid they might be the next ones to be crucified. Followers of Jesus, after all. They're not at the tomb. The, the women went down to do the important thing, and that was to uh, anoint the body of Jesus, or so they thought. The men are hidden, cowardly, and up in the room. And uh, Jesus uh, has to appear to them. So evening comes and still no apostles running down to the tomb. So uh, Peter and John finally made an exit, went down to take a look, but they didn't see Jesus. They saw his grave clothes. That convinced them. But the others are waiting in the upper room when Jesus suddenly appears. And Jesus comes to them and they think it's a ghost. It's a spirit. But Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as ye see me have. And so they sat down curiously with him. And of course, we'll go into detail about this in the next couple of weeks or so. But Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Now the doors are locked at this point, but he's able to uh, come right through the doors. Transmigration. But they were terrified, it says, and affrighted. And suppose that they'd seen a spirit. And then it says, and while they believed not for joy and wondered... He said, have you here any meat? So here's their fear. They're terrified. They think it's a ghost, but it, it's Jesus. And so he quells their fear. He settles them down. They don't believe at first because they're so frightened by what they're seeing. And then they're so overjoyed when they realize Jesus is sitting down. He's eating with them. A ghost can't eat. They see that he has hands and feet and they, they can touch him and, and they, they can feel. And so now they rejoice. Great joy. Now it is Jesus. And they look at him with great wonderment. Look at this passage in Jeremiah, chapter 33. You all know chapter 33, 3, don't you? That's the phone number of Jesus, right? Call upon me and I will answer thee. Better write that one down in your phone book, right next to the 911s. But in the 8th verse, he said, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities. Isn't this good news? Amen. Whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me, and it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I pray, procure unto it. He's talking collectively of the believers, particularly of the nation Israel, but collectively of all those that would believe and have their sins expunged, have the record thrown out, and be able to say, look, my sins and iniquities he remembers no more. 
Look, every one of us should have feared standing before a holy God. Now, I've been in the courtroom with people that were sentenced, and I've watched fellas that you would think are macho guys and so forth, and they've done heinous crimes. And I've watched the judge come in in his uh, stately black robe, and he uh, sits behind uh, the, uh, the desk, and he's got file folders with people's records in them and so forth, and, and then he's ready to pass sentence, and uh, the, the accused has to stand before the judge for sentencing. And he stands there, and, and you can watch them. I don't care how bold and big and their threats are, they're, all of a sudden they're shaking. They're standing before a judge, and the judge is about to condemn them. Terrible. It would be worse to stand before the eternal judge of all the ages who needs no witnesses, who has everything I've ever done or said, and he can refer to those files of the past. Yes, indeed, you'll shake, you'll quake before the presence of God, you'll tremble, except somebody standing next to you. Amen. You have an advocate with the Father. You have... Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know that no matter what God has on file against you, Jesus has already paid at the cross. Amen. What's he say here? All your iniquities, whereby they have sinned. All of these things, whereby you have transgressed. But you're going to be given a, 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 a name of praise and joy. He's going to take the fear and the trembling out of us. And uh, for the rest of our eternity, we will enjoy the everlasting presence of a holy God. There's another place in Psalm 2 that speaks of, it almost sounds contradictory. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. I don't think I'll ever lose the fear of the Lord in its clean sense. How about you? Uh, I hope you all had loving fathers, did you? If you had a loving father, uh, I had a loving father and a severe father. Right? I feared him, but I loved him at the same time. Now, how can you do that, right? <laughs> if you have a good father, that's exactly what he ought to be. He ought to be a father figure, a person that you can look up to, admire, know that he loves you, that he's your provider and protector, but also know if you step out of line, he's going to chastise you. So uh, we have fear and trembling. We serve God with all of our heart, with rejoicing and with fear and with trembling. The nation Israel, the apple of God's eye in a sense, nationally speaking. I'm not saying that all Jews are saved. They have to be under the blood of Christ if they want to be saved. God came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. But God did make a promise to Abraham that he would revive that nation no matter how recalcitrant and unbelieving they had become. And so, throughout the prophecies, we see the Lord returning to his elect nation, Israel. One passage in Joel, chapter 2, tells us of the day of God's regathering of the nation of Israel. There's error being taught in the church today, uh, and the idea of replacement theology, that somehow that the church, the Gentile church, has replaced Israel, and that uh, God will have nothing to do with Israel any longer. Well, that's just, <laughs> it's poor theology, poor reading of Romans 9, 10, and 11, obviously. And certainly, what do these prophecies mean? Well, the nation, even under its judgment, under Joel's prophecies, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. And Isaiah tells us in the 35th chapter, say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing will flee away. That's what uh, the promise is. Joy and fear. Uh, wonderful emotions, that all the uh, spectrum of emotion that you can see, all of it seen in the birth and the death and the resurrection and the coming again of Jesus Christ. Back to the text. So now we're going to look at Matthew. You know, I've got to take, you guys ever try to uh, put a Rubik's Cube together? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, it's usually, a, it's a vain pursuit. 
uh, and you have to have a lot of patience to put one of those things together. But uh, you can see, you can twist the blues and they're all in one line and then the next thing, the green and the red and the yellow and you, you, and you try to get them all so that the, each side of the cube has the right color. But uh, no matter how you turn it, sometimes you can't seem to get it right. When you take uh, the prophecies in scripture and you look at the Bible, you realize you've got to be able to turn all these things together and try to mingle them together. And sometimes it just doesn't seem to fit well. And don't worry about all of that because God did not give us all the details that we need. So sometimes what seems to be a chronological uh, contradiction is not really a contradiction. It's just how it was read and uh, revealed by that author. Matthew sees it in a, a different light than Luke does, than John does, uh, than Mark does. So we see four different angles of the same story. And, uh, and their particular angle gives us a personal viewpoint and I think it's, uh, if we put them all together, uh, we have a rich uh, uh, composite of the Lord Jesus. So chapter 28 tells us in Matthew's gospel that they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. So you can see that they're in a big hurry here. And uh, People ought to be in a hurry when it comes to their salvation. It's what I call the doctrine of urgency. People put off their salvation. People say, you know, at some time they're going to give some time to this. But right now they're too busy with the affairs of life. They have enough time just going to work. You know how the devil ties us up with a lot of trivial details that really aren't going to matter in eternity. But for us in the world, it's very important and so on. And uh, some people will, <laughs> thankfully God is very merciful, some people get sick. And as a result, what's the old expression, he maketh me to lie down. He forces you sometimes to be in a position where you have to contemplate your own terminality, that you're going to be here for a little bit of time, you're temporal. And uh, you could go at any moment and you start to realize that and you start to come to the grips of uh, the, real, uh, the real important things in life, and that would be your eternal destiny. So, remember back in Luke, we talked about uh, Jesus sending out the 70 two by two, and he did so. He said, you're gonna have to do this and go out, uh, carry neither the purse, nor the script, nor shoes, uh, nor salute any man by the way. He said, in other words, you've got to go out in a hurry and do what needs to be done in a hurry. You've got to get out and don't worry about having a purse with you. Don't worry about your shoes. Don't worry about your cell phone, right? Just go. So the doctrine of urgency, the kingdom was at hand and it was important to announce that the king was coming. And so they were to go out quickly without any of these necessities, so to speak. Well, the king's business requireth haste. God's business requires us to urge people to believe and to trust and, and to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't know what another day is going to bring. We just don't really understand it. This COVID thing should be making people think. I would, I would hope so. But there's so much denial about uh, how temporal our lives are. People, ah, it's not going to happen to me. I'll, you know, don't worry about me. I'm going to be okay and so on. Uh, maybe not. You really don't know. And it might not be COVID that takes you. I mean, I've seen some of you drive. So, right. You could, you could be gone in a heartbeat. <laughs> So what are we going to do? You can slip on a banana peel. My dad used to say you could walk outside and a brick will hit you on the head. Well, that could happen. Life is uncertain. It's obvious here that God has permitted us to live in a tenuous circumstance. There's but a step between me and death, David said. And that's true of all of us. And so if you're a wise person, Amos 4.12 says, you'll prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. So we've got to go out with the king's business in a hurry and tell people Jesus saves. God has sent a savior into the world. Forget about Santa Claus, Frosty, and uh, Rudolph and all this nonsense uh, that's really in the way. Understand that this is about the birth of the Son of God. It's about a savior coming to give his life at the cross so you and I could live. Uh, so I made haste and I delayed not, 
to keep thy commandments. I was in a hurry. And Luke 19, remember Zacchaeus was up in the tree and um, Jesus said, make haste, come down. Uh, he saw him, he said, today I'm going to abide in your house. And Zacchaeus went from the tree right down to the ground as quickly as he could. He made haste to find Jesus. And uh, you must also make haste. Come down, humble yourself, and receive him joyfully, joyfully. We don't know again how long all this is going to be. People t telling me all the while they think that the end is near. We're in the end of the world. It could be. Um, that wouldn't surprise me. I've been waiting for it since I got saved. It hasn't happened. And I'm glad it hasn't because a lot of you would still be quite lost. So I think it was a good thing that the Lord delayed his coming. But he's coming sure enough and in a moment that no one expects. So Romans tells us, and knowing the time that now it is high time to awake. So God is already telling us it's high time. In other words, be ready uh, at any moment. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. He shall have mercy upon him. And unto our God, he shall abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 6. 2 Corinthians tells us, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. And Hebrews tells us today, while it is yet called today, harden not your hearts. So be ready to meet the Lord. So back to the text. So they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and with great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. See that expression? Jesus met them. So here they are on the way. And I like to say, look, they're leaving now just on the word of the angel. Well, they've seen something too that uh, you'd have to say they saw something. Well, they did. They saw an empty tomb. But they didn't see him. They just walked by faith. They heard the good news that Jesus was risen from the dead, and that was all they needed. And so, you and I must walk by faith also. Nobody here has seen the Lord. We have to trust the word that has been given to us, that he is indeed the Savior, and that he is risen again for our justification. We trust that word. We heard the good news. We believed it. And we went out, hopefully, to tell others. They ran out of the tomb in a hurry. And they did it all by faith. They were walking by faith, running by faith. And they went to spread the gospel. You know, the worst thing that's happened out of this pandemic is the fact that our ministries are curtailed. Uh, so many places that we go to preach the gospel now all closed. We can't get the word in. And that saddens me. This is what I live for, is to tell the truth and to get the truth into hearts of people that desperately need it. But for now, in God's uh, providence, God's permission, I must say, God isn't the author of this evil. In his permission, the world's going through something right now. And perhaps it's an important wake-up call for people to realize how fragile the equation is. I realize people are going to be losing their jobs, losing their businesses and so forth. They're going to be terrible times. But if you have Jesus, you don't lose anything. Amen. If you have Christ, you have a hope beyond this world and all of its temporal miseries and problems. All right, so they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and they did run. So they were in a hurry, and they brought uh, the gospel. They spread the gospel to those that were hiding in the upper room, the men, to tell them. So the first evangels, the first messengers of the gospel, were these women. And they came back with the good news that Jesus saves. On the way back, Matthew tells us, they saw Jesus. Jesus met them. As it were, their faith becomes sight. Seeing Jesus, Jesus met them, saying, all hail. <clears throat> Some expositors say the word all hail is literally understood to be, oh joy. <laughs> so maybe. So here they are running 
to tell the disciples, and here's Jesus intersecting now in the road, and he says uh, to them, all hail, Jesus met them. Oh, this is a, it's a beautiful moment when you meet Jesus. I hope you've all met him, that you've been to the empty tomb. You went to the cross with your sins. You went to the empty tomb to see that he was risen. You heard the glorious tidings that he is risen indeed, and you went running back, and you met him on the road. And what a difference it'll make for the rest of your eternity because you met him and they met him at this point and they fell at his feet and what else, how else would you react? So as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them and said, all hail. And they came and, and they held him by the feet and they worshiped him. In 1 Corinthians 13, very strange expression there. For now, behold, we see through a glass darkly or dimly. The word there in the Greek is enigma. We see an enigma. You and I can see a little bit when we're reading the Bible about who Jesus is and what he is. The revelation is quite partial, beloved. There's a veil between this world and the next. There's only so much that we can see and understand. We see, as it were, as Paul said, through the glass, darkly. Mirrors in those days weren't what we have. We have highly polished mirrors. We can look and we can see at everything, things we don't want to see, wrinkles, pimples, and everything else, right? But in those days, they just had basically a polished stone. And this is what an enigma was. It was just a polished stone. And you could see your reflection in it. Something like when you walk past a, a window, you see your reflection, but you don't see much of who you are. No detail, so to speak, just kind of a shadowy figure. We see through a glass, darkly, dimly, so now our experience is partial understanding. We're going by faith, folks. We haven't seen him, right? In whom having not seen, ye love, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your salvation. So when Paul speaks of this seeing through the glass darkly, but he said, uh, then face to face, all right, so the, the ladies are running on the word. They've heard the word, that's enough for them. Jesus must be risen. The angels have come to tell us the good news. They're running back to tell the others when suddenly their faith becomes sight. They see him. Then, face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Faith and hope is what brings us finally to the heavenly borders. Faith and hope. We have faith in something we cannot see right now, but we believe it. We've heard the word and that's good enough for us. And we're running with that and we're running a good race, I hope. And, and one day though, that faith and hope will be unnecessary. Why? Because we will see him as he is face to face. Hey, what a glorious moment that's going to be, right? <laughs> We're going to see him face to face and no doubt we'll fall at his feet. And we will, uh, we will rejoice in that hour. The songwriter said, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrows there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness and no more pain, no more parting over there. But forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. It says that Jesus met them. Well, he's coming to meet us too, isn't he? He's coming in the air. First Thessalonians 4 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We'll meet him 
And what a meeting in the air that's going to be. He's going to call us out of this world. That's his promise. You say it's been 2,000 years since Jesus said those words, those fateful words, the night before he was crucified. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Oh, he's coming. And he's coming to meet us on our journey. As we're going forth to spread the gospel, suddenly our faith will become sight. We see through the glass darkly, beloved. There are a lot of things that I can't explain to you and troubles that you are enduring and problems that nobody here understands but you yourselves. Disappointments in life, losses, physical agonies, all of this is part of a sin-sick world. But the day is coming, the glorious day, when he'll take us by the hand and lead us to the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. So Lord, we intend to have ourselves a blessed little Christmas. Knowing you makes all the difference. Even a virus can't take our joy from us. So we assemble, Lord, because we love you. We love to learn about you and remember your words. We love, Lord, to reannounce the truth week in and week out. And may we never tire in hearing it. And Lord, may it have such an impression upon our hearts that it changes us. We began the service with the story of a man who was a worldly man, wrote worldly songs, depressing songs. And then he found faith. And when that happened, everything changed, even the lyrics of his song. And indeed, Lord, for us as well, we found ourselves in a horrible pit. The miry clay, it was a trap. And the devil was pulling us down, down, downward. It certainly would have ended up in the lake of fire. But you brought us out of that pit. You placed our feet upon that rock. You established our going. And you put a new song in our mouth. We thank you for the day that we met you, Lord. Now you help us, Lord, as long as we're in this tabernacle of flesh, to be stirred up by remembrance. May the hope that we have, Lord, abide with us and abide strong within us. May we become an avid uh, witness. May we, like the uh, women at the tomb, run with alacrity with the message and to take it to where you would uh, open up doors for us, Lord. Hearts and ears listening to the truth. And may that truth be a living reality. May it be seen in our lives, Lord, in the way that we conduct ourselves. So help us this morning. So bless us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you again tonight. To accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels.
But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come into my heart, Lord.